What if I told you that light is actually electromagnetic radiation released in quantum units? We think of it moving like waves, but it does not. Light emanates from its source in all directions and lessens in brightness and in intensity the further away it travels. Light travels in a straight line and then it's reflected or absorbed depending on the surface or material that it meets on its path. Reflected light is less bright or intense than direct light. A light meter is used to measure the level of illumination on a surface. But what is actually happening there is the light meter is converting the radiant energy into an electrical current that reveals the strength of electromagnetic radiation. This is even possible because light causes electrons to move. The moving electrons move faster at higher temperatures, causing the intensity of radiation to increase. The human eye is able to see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Each of the colors of the electromagnetic radiation has a specific frequency which is measured in cycles per second or hertz. The measurement was named after the person who first was able to prove the existence of electromagnetic waves, Heinrich Rudolf Hertz in the 1800s. But it wasn't until the 1970s that the term cycles per second was replaced by the term hertz. I'm sure that you've heard the term burning the midnight oil. This makes sense when we understand that the earliest forms of supplemental lighting were created through burning plant and animal oils in various containers made of clay, metal, bone, or stone. Beeswax was also used, and candle making became a time-consuming task, as well as an art. Natural gas replaced coal gas, illuminating houses and streets, creating visible, safer spaces. While using artificial light has allowed people to work harder longer and stay up way too late doing their homework, one of the best things that we can do for our clients is to incorporate the use of daylighting in our designs. This can be done through windows, top lighting and side lighting, and doors that allow the light to enter into the space. Clearstory and skylights are examples of top lighting, while vertical and horizontal windows are examples of side lighting. They allow the daylight to illuminate the space. Poor lighting can lead to eye strain, fatigue, headaches, stress, depression, and accidents or mistakes. So if we understand the needed use of a space, we may better be able to plan varied light sources when we begin our design, and we are better able to meet the lighting needs. The lighting and the lighting budget need to be considered at the very start of our design. Using sunlight for illumination, known as daylighting, as a light source, it saves energy costs and makes us feel better overall. Daylighting consideration in the design of a new build has a great impact on the positioning of a building, its shape and architecture, as well as the arrangement of doors and windows that will let in the light. Fenestration is the fancy name that means the design construction, or presence of openings in a building. 
when we design buildings for optical illumination and thermal performance, what we are actually doing is called passive solar design. Passive solar design considers the angle of the sun, how the light and sunlight will affect the space through places of entrance and how the heat will be retained or ventilated. We can use angles of light, paint colors, absorptive as well as reflective surfaces to invite light into a space move light through a space or stop it from going any further. One of the ways that we might do this is through the use of light shelves to reflect sunlight onto the ceiling and into the space, whether they're outside the building or inside, so that the space is illuminated, but not taking on the direct heat of the sunlight. Another way to direct the light diffuse it or stop it from entering is through the use of shades, lines, or window coverings. When the light hits a surface that doesn't absorb the energy of the radiation, it reflects away from the point of impact. Mirrors used on the walls can reflect light or bring light to other areas of the room. This also applies to other reflective surfaces. Using the same idea, the heliostat was created. A heliostat is a mirrored dish that tracks the movement of the sun continuously through the day. The sunlight that it locates is then reflected onto a second mirror, which can be used to light dark areas in a neighborhood that has tall buildings or as part of a lighting system that uses pipes to deliver the daylight anywhere in the building. The light tubes can be heliostat fed or a sun tunnel or a daylight tube but they increase the flow of natural daylight into the space, decreasing energy used and increasing the light economic value of your design. The history of electric lighting started in 1809 by an English chemist named Humphrey Davy. Davy invented the first ever electric arc lamp. By connecting two wires to a battery and attached a charcoal strip between them, which charged carbon and made it glow. This light, although intense, was very unreliable, only lasting a few minutes. Seventy years later, Thomas Edison created the first incandescent lamp, invented in 1879. This lamp lasted only 15 hours. Fast forward many years and many inventors later, the high intensity discharge lamp technology now has a light lasting over 24,000 hours. Until recently, incandescent lamps were the most common light sources used in residential applications. Fluorescent lamps were mostly used in commercial and institutional spaces. Today, LEDs, otherwise known as light emitting diodes, and CFLs, known as compact fluorescent lamps, are taking over much of the market. High intensity discharge lights are used to illuminate large indoor and outdoor arenas, such as stadiums and parking lots. There are several types of light source controls. Daylight harvesting is a photo sensor that detects levels of daylight and automatically adjusts the output level of electric lighting. This can be mounted to a ceiling or incorporated in a wall switch. Multiple level switching provides two levels of light, lighting power by controlling lamps independently. Continuous dimming provides less abrupt change created by multi-level switch systems and can work in conjunction with daylight sensors. Occupancy controls are automatic lighting that uses motion sensors to detect occupancy and will turn on and off depending on the motion in the space. 
Light fixtures can be chosen to complement the architecture and to emphasize architectural features and patterns. Decorative fixtures can enhance the interior decor as well. Shown here are a few different types of light fixtures. Wall washers are surface mounted fixtures designed to illuminate a vertical surface. Up lights may be suspended from the ceiling or mounted on furniture or walls. Recessed lights are fixtures that are recessed into a ceiling or wall construction. Track mounted lights are adjustable spotlights or floodlights mounted on a track and can be moved or aimed in a particular direction. Pendant lights are ceiling mounted fixtures that typically hang below the ceiling on a chain or cord. Some of you may heard the term luminaire, which is just another term for light fixture. There are a variety of lighting design applications. For example, in residential applications, you start by assessing daylighting, then applying appropriate ambient, task, and accent lighting. For commercial applications, including institutional and industrial, they have their own lighting requirements, which generally use more than one type of fixture specific to the area. In retail lighting, it's more geared towards leading customers inside and focusing the lighting elements so that the retail goods are properly illuminated. This is important to ensure that the light is offering good color, contrast, and balance so that the products are properly displayed. For public toilet room lighting, it must be well lit with a combination of general lighting for public use and task lighting for proper cleaning and sanitation. There are guidelines for illumination levels. Task lighting should provide high levels of illumination as to see the task at hand. Ambient lighting for general levels of illumination should be one third as high as task levels. Accent lighting should not be greater than five times the ambient level. Lighting equipment that is an integral part of a building is referred to as architectural lighting. There are several types of architectural lighting. Cove lighting is indirect lighting of a ceiling from a continuous wall mounted fixtures. Cornice lighting is ornamental moldings around the wall of a room just below the ceiling which illuminates the ceiling only. Coffer lighting are large recessed panels in the ceiling which are illuminated. Valence lighting illuminates the wall above and below. There are some guidelines when it comes to mounting and installation of light fixtures. First off, it's important to talk to the users of the space so that the location of the lighting controls are within reach and readily accessible. Each zone should be separately circuited and each task light should have its own switch. Proper installation involves mounting fixtures directly to the building structure to avoid the risk of falling luminaires. A lighting designer or interior designer prepares a lighting plan and schedule. The fixture selections and locations must coordinate with the HVAC engineers so that the power loads can be monitored and up to code. Building energy codes may require that each head on the track be counted as a separate fixture when dealing with track mounted fixtures. The mounting height in general of a residential area should be between 30 to 40 inches from the countertop. And if applying multiple fixtures, should be at least 30 inches apart. When it comes to wall mounted fixtures, it is important that they are at least 60 to 65 inches from the ground and a minimum of eight feet apart. All commercial buildings require emergency lighting. Exit sign lighting in non-residential facilities are required at all exits with an illuminance of five foot candles. A foot candle is one lumen per square foot. And all aisles, corridors, ramps, and lobbies leading to an exit also require an exit sign light. These lights should be lit and turned on while the building is in use at all times. It is also recommended to have power backup during these power outages. That can be done by purchasing an exit light that has direct wire with battery backup. That way the battery charges while the wire is hooked up and on in the building. 
This is all recommended to be in compliance with the codes according to the National Fire Protection Association, otherwise known as the NFPA. There are two standard exit signs. The US standard exit sign is exit written in lit red letters. And then there's the international standard exit sign, which is a green running man, typically shown with an arrow in the direction of the fire exit 